I wasn't prepared with the amount of reactions that I got when I went home. They're like, you need to know right now that you never deserve the right to get married. I'm sad for you because you will be going to hell one day. It was really ridiculing. Welcome back to another episode. My name is Kirsty Pike. And I'm Christine Diaz, and we are the hosts of the original podcast, She Comes With Baggage. So last time, Christine showed her coming out story, and now it's my turn. I am very nervous. I'm a little sweaty. You're going to do great. Thanks. You're going to do great. <laughs> back at it again. Back at it. <laughs> so now that I revealed so many details <laughs> about myself <laughs> that I honestly haven't talked about in a really long time. We can start with you. Great. So take me back to a young Kirsty. Well, before we go too much into it, I just think it's funny that when we started doing this podcast, we came in, you had heels, you were wearing all nice outfits, and now look at us, just covered in blankets <laughs> and, and hoodies. And I'm like, this is the... This is setting the tone <laughs> yeah. for this conversation right now. I, th I feel like we need to be in our cozies. I like it. I like it. It makes you feel already comfortable. Not the girl's sweater. I, I knew that this was what we were going to be talking about today, so I wanted to <laughs> represent. I'm, I'm just trying to represent with my girl's crew neck. I love it. Do you? I like approve. You? I approve. approve. Perfect. Yeah. I'm glad you approve. <laughs> I'm here represent representing all the girls. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what do you want to know? Okay. So. <laughs> Where do I begin? You were born and raised Tennessee. Yes. What was, what was that like for you? Like, did you know when you were in Tennessee that you were going to come out? Or what was your coming out experience like? In a weird way. I still think, feel like we come out every single day. You know, you and I, with the platform we have, we're always sharing our coming out story to a certain degree because we're wanting people to find a little bit of relatability, a little bit of comfort with us, even though, because coming out is scary, you know, it can be. Yeah. So, yeah, I think when I was living in Tennessee, absolutely no way did I know that this is, would be where my life is now. Like if I didn't have visibility, you definitely didn't have no. visibility. Yeah. Where I'm from is I was born in Memphis and then I grew up about 30 minutes outside of Nashville. It's, it's in a town called Murfreesboro. And um, in Memphis, definitely, I, that was not a... Also, didn't they just pass a law that you could publicly be out? Yeah. Because you even, couldn't? Not before? even a few months ago, just a few months ago, Murfreesboro passed, a, like, took away the law that says you could not be publicly gay in Murfreesboro. That's insane. Just a few months ago. That's insane that that still exists. Like, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. just kind of goes to show that's where you grew up. Yeah. So Memphis was definitely, um, it, I was just so young when I lived there that I was, I didn't know what even liking people meant, right? Then we moved to Murfreesboro where I still had no representation at all. There was never a conversation about queer people. And every now and then you would hear someone say, that's so gay or talk about gay but it was always in a very negative connotation and no one actually explained what it meant right they just said that's so gay or that you know talking about uh, either a gay man too right mm -hmm. and then if they were talking about a gay man it was always something really negative or they were you know gossiping and southern gossip they they're always like bless your heart bless your heart you know but that really means like we don't we're worry. talking shit behind your back <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah so um my my understanding of what being queer was was i that was not an option because i did not even recognize that that was a possibility that was just never talked about i mean not not even just people that are in the lgbtq plus community but like even hispanic people or yeah. Asian people or anyone like you really didn't have anyone no there's barely any diversity where I'm from there was white people and black people and if there was any kind of Latin representation it was always a very stereotypical kind of jobs where it was either in construction lawn care there was landscaping. no one. yeah so there was no diversity at all and I've shown you pictures of my high school gatherings and stuff where it was a majority white 
cis people, right? And and whenever it came to being LGBTQ, there was just nobody. I, there wasn't anyone. No one that was out anyways. And so, yeah, I went through most of my adolescence years, young years, teenage years, all the way up until, you know, being an adult through college, had no idea that this was an option. And yeah, I think it was just a really, it was a difficult period, especially because, you know, my, I had an aunt that was always with another woman who just like more masculine presenting and uh, growing up, our family always said that's her roommate. You know, she would even refer to her, this other person as her roommate, roommate, roommate. But that person was always in her life and it was in our family's lives for years and years and years throughout my entire growing up, me growing up. And eventually I started questioning it. My sisters and I started questioning it. Like, are we sure they're roommates? <laughs> like, why are they always together? We're like, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think, I was always, I would always felt that it was unfair that the family wouldn't ask more questions. And I'm like, doesn't it bother you that they can't be honest, you know? And, and so I think my coming out story will go into that a little bit more as I grow up. But as a young kid, I had no idea. On, on that same note, I look back now and I'm like, why didn't anyone tell me I was a gay baby, like a little baby gay? Because I was so gay growing up. I just didn't know. I was super tomboy, played sports with all the guys. I Like uh, everyone else knew, but you didn't know yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Why didn't anyone tell me? I Your uh, aunts actually said they knew. Yeah. They were like, oh, yeah, she's going to be one of us. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> why didn't you tell me? Right. I... At one point, I cut all my hair off. Like, I literally had the shortest hair. And because I never thought that I was a boy. Like, that was never my experience. But I definitely always wanted to be with the boys. Like, I wanted to hang with the boys. I played with G.I. Joes. I was always like, ew, don't let me touch those Barbies. My hand's going to fall off. You know, I want the G.I. Joes. When I played The Sims, I always played the male characters. I always wanted to play this... Um, I always wanted to play this gender role of being the man and playing this, the protector, the provider, all these things. As a kid, I didn't know that. I just knew that I wanted to play the boy part. You know, I just always wanted to do that. In the plays, whenever my sisters and I would perform for my parents and sing songs and put on plays, I was always the male part. I, it, I don't know why, you know, but I look back on it now and I'm like, gay? <laughs> That's super gay, you know? And uh, I don't know. I, I just realized that I didn't have the representation, so I didn't know what any of that meant. That was just my truth of who I was as a kid. And I went to middle school. Uh, I went to middle school. I always dressed really masculine. I always wore really baggy shirts and pants. And I went to Murfreesboro at this time, right? First, I was in Memphis, and then I moved to Murfreesboro. I think when I moved to Murfreesboro, it was a lot less acceptable to dress in baggy clothes, baggy outfits, right? At this point in time, people were starting to become a little meaner in the sense where you have to dress and act this way if you're a girl. You have to care about makeup. You have to start dressing girly because you, you want the boys' attention. And I was always like, I don't want that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do my makeup. I want to go and play sports. So I just kept playing soccer and all these things. But everyone kept telling me from such a young age, you have to dress this way. You have to. Why are you dressing like that? And you used to hate it, right? I mean, yeah. I feel like even now you really despise wearing dresses yeah uh, I think I own no I don't think I own a dress you no <laughs> I do own like three pairs of heels and I just keep wearing Rotate them. them and that's only because I'm shorter than you by like half an inch so I have to wear heels. you said it not me yeah <laughs> I have to wear heels in order to be somewhat on your level or else nothing wrong with being a short queen but I that just makes me feel better when we're doing content I don't know what was the moment where you're like I like this person who's not a man <laughs> well I think for a long time because there was no representation I just got really attached to certain friends and I was just very very obsessed with certain friends and I started to feel like this um, intense relationship with them to me is that I really 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 liked being around this person and I really 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 enjoyed their time even though I look back on it now and I was like, that was clearly a crush, but I didn't know how or what that meant then, but now I recognize it. 
before I would be like, we're going to spend all of our time together and we're going to wake up and we're going to call each other and we're going to hold hands whenever no one's looking. And this is what we're going to do because this is what best friends do. No, that's definitely gay. You know what I mean? But I didn't know that. So I, looking back on it now, I definitely had crushes on different girls growing up that I just thought were my best, bestest friends. Yeah, I, I didn't have a first oh shit moment until much, much later in life. I think my Tennessee life now, I realize, was very much surrounded by the theory compulsory heterosexuality. Compulsory heterosexuality. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my Tennessee life was very much surrounded by the idea of compulsory heterosexuality, which essentially means that... The only option for your ac actions and the way you think and act are all surrounded by the patriarchy or a heterosexual lifestyle, a heteronormative lifestyle, right? So basically, the only option is to date boys, so I thought that that's what I was supposed to do. The only option is to put on makeup and dress like a girl because that's what you're supposed to do at this age. And so you're taught this over and over and over again, that these are the gender roles that you're supposed to be playing, and you're supposed to be liking boys at this time, and you're supposed to be not doing these things. So I think I, it was ingrained in my head over and over again. And you also have to think that this is the Bible Belt. So where I'm from, you're supposed to act, in, act a certain way and chase boys and stuff, but it's the Bible Belt. So they're really telling you that being gay is wrong, you know, interracial relationships are wrong, Things like this where I'm always That's like... That's insane. Yeah. It's, there, there's so many things that they're telling you is wrong. You're living the wrong life, long life, wrong life all, all the time. This is what you're taught. I remember when I was in church, and this my whole life was surrounded by church at the time. I grew up Baptist. And I remember every Sunday we had to go to church and then Sunday school. And I remember from a very young age questioning, well, like, what happens if there's not a God? And everyone's like... <gasps> kick her out you know and and I'm like but why is no one asking this question you know and then I remember you know it was very almost cult like where I went to church because they would tell you now is the time you have to get on your knees and pray to God and I remember being like no and they're they're you know you have to get on your knees and pray and I was like no I'm not gonna do it what are you gonna do and I remember I got kicked out of church that day and my parents were you know trying but to did your parents really care about religion that much or was it it was more so your friends and society yeah it goes back to that way of living where you feel like you have to do a certain mm -hmm. thing so my parents were also raised baptist so they just went to church because that's what you're supposed to do in the south and so i remember i got kicked out and i and that just made me more of a rebel where I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to ask all the questions that I'm not supposed to ask. Why doesn't my aunt tell everyone that she's dating a woman? Because no one's asking this question, but I will. Yeah. Right. So I think I became a very much of a rebel at a very young age, which also made me become like the black sheep of the family because everyone's like, couldn't make me stay quiet and couldn't make me stay in line. And, and it's interesting because as much as I was becoming this rebel, I also really, really had this urge to fit in and I wanted people to like me. But so it was like this balance of being a rebel and going against what people wanted, but also trying so being hard. Being a rebel enough to be liked. Yeah, but also still fitting in. So it's kind of funny, you know, growing up in high school, I loved high school. I, I loved... Kersey was popular in high school. <laughs> I hate saying that word, but I loved she was it. also prom queen. I was prom queen in high school. Yeah. So I got the crown and everything in high school. It was crazy. And and it just Do you goes... think anyone knew at that time? No. Oh, like no. when they were crowning you? No, absolutely not. I do know that the who the prom king from everybody would make kind of like jokes and say that there were two queens this year because he was kind of an out gay man. And at the time, this is all I knew was people were kind of like joking about it. Like, oh, there's two queens this year, two queens. And I remember feeling kind of that was disrespectful. You know, I felt like kind of gross about that in general. I was like, why can't I accept my win if they're going to be making fun of this guy? Why would they crown him and then turn around and make fun of it? And not everybody was because obviously you got voted in. Right. But he was well liked, but people just found comfort in making fun of that. And I just never knew why that made me so uncomfortable outside of the fact that 
outside of the fact that it was just wrong to make fun of people in general, I didn't know why that actually hurt me on a deeper level because probably because I also liked people of the same sex. I just subconsciously didn't know it yet. Right. And I just remember thinking, Oh God, what would, you know, good thing I'm not gay because what would people say about me kind of thing. Coming out from being prom queen. I don't know. I know you said you, or I know this about you, but I know you left home. Yeah. Well, going into high school, I already had, I wasn't always very family oriented in the sense I've always felt like the black sheep and I always felt like no one wanted to Mm -hmm. take my answer, my questions seriously. And so I feel like I got in a lot of trouble growing up with my family, like a lot, especially my, my mom, my dad was away. He went to, he did a tour in Afghanistan. And at this time I was very rebellious. And so I was actually, my best friend at the time kind of took me in, my best friend, Kristen. My best friend at the time would kind of take me in and raise me a little bit as a big sister in a way. And I never realized then that I actually really loved the feeling of being taken care of the way she would make me feel taken care of. And I realized like, Maybe it wasn't a crush, but it was this feeling of another girl making me feel loved that I had never felt before where I finally felt like I was okay and I was safe and I was taken care of. And then in in high school, you're also hanging out with friends and doing, you know, crazy things. You know, you're just girls making out with girls. Exactly. It was definitely a thing. I think it's still a thing now. Yeah. And where I'm from, people were all like, Oh, we're going to make out. So we're going to impress the boys. We're right. going to impress the boys. If right. We it's like, it's for the boys yeah. type of thing. And I was like, but you're but, like, but like, it's let's also make out with the boys. Who you wants know? to make out with me? <laughs> I'm you're like, volunteering if yourself. The boys, if there's a boy even near us, let's make out and just impress. Him. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I'm looking for reasons to like get cozy with one of my girlfriends, even though they're trying to impress boys. I'm like, yeah, me too. I am too. <laughs> You're like, you know? yeah. But also in the South, it's kind of funny how twisted it is. Like we would have slumber parties where we're all cuddling and things like that. Like, I think that's kind your, of a normal your, thing. Your soccer team and stuff. I used to do that with them. I mean, it's, it's not something you like outwardly think about and you're like, I'm a lesbian. This is why I'm doing it. Yeah. But I think it's all part of your journey of realizing like, maybe this is something that I could be interested in and it's not like a particular someone. Yeah. But it's the fact that like, it's not guys that you want to do this with. Yeah. Which also really confused me because I remember being like, this is normal, but why do I like it more than everyone else? Everyone else is just doing this because we're all friends, but why is it that I really want to have slumber parties with my friends who are girls? Like, why am I really looking for their affirmations or their like you care more about their opinions yeah, than anyone absolutely. else and it's also probably because you do trust them like they are your friends mm-hmm. and so 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 yeah I I started feeling like little crushes even though I didn't know that it was a crush at the time I felt these like little feelings towards my closest girl friends but then I would later recognize oh I get it now what it was then but I, I didn't know that then it was very innocent 100% mm-hmm. innocent And so, yeah, I went through high school like that. I started dressing more femme because that's what everyone told me to do. Uh, Yeah, I I struggled a lot with my self-identity in that way because I always felt very, very uncomfortable wearing dresses and floral clothes and my friends would put on my makeup. And I always wanted to cry because I was just like, this is not me, but I'm doing it because everyone's telling me it is me, Mm -hmm. you know, even though it just feels wrong. The next part of things, I I graduated high school and I moved to college and I actually went to one of my, the same best friend that kind of raised me. I went with her to her college because she was like my older sister at this point. She was my family. And I was like, I'm going where my family is, uh, which was Kristen, my best friend. And so I went to college with her and it was amazing. And I think that was when I was drinking a lot more and partying and going all out. And I think, so I, I, you know, had my first girl experience in college and I blamed it on alcohol. And I said, it was definitely drinking. Like, I'll never do that again. Happened again. And then I just remember being so devastated with myself. I remember sitting in my dorm room, bawling my eyes out because I was like, what's wrong with me? Why, why do I, why do I feel so depressed? But I also know I liked it, which made me feel so sad, you know, mm-hmm. and lonely. And I can't ask anyone. I can't ask anyone. My college was also, I think, 
less than 2,000 students on campus. And it was in the middle of bumfuck Tennessee, in the middle of nowhere. You had It was in the tri-state area of Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee, I think. So really in the sticks. Like you I were think in a the dry state too, right? Hmm? It was a dry it was state. it was a dry dry school dry state. You had to drive all the way to Virginia to pick up alcohol and smuggle it over the border into the to the. I university. mean, just kind of goes to show, like super Bible Belt. Yeah. Area. Yeah. It was you know everything was closed on Sundays because that's God's day kind of thing. So my university was very small and there wasn't again there wasn't a lot of representation. So I was super scared. I remember being really scared at being like. I don't like this feeling. Please make me straight, please, because I don't want to be like this. I'm so scared right now of what this means for me. And so I basically had a breakdown and I was, you know, this is one one year into my university experience. And I was like, you know what I should do? I was like, I think I should move to the other side of the country and start my life over and no one will know who I am. No one will ever know anything about this with me. And I'm going to be straight. And I'm I'm not going to be and gay. I'm going to move to the gayest city in all of the U.S. <laughs> there was an art school in San Francisco. I was so sheltered. I mean, I had never heard of South of Nowhere. I had never heard of most TV that had any kind of queer characters. We didn't have access to skins. We didn't have I mean, access to Harry movies. Potter was considered a witchcraft at yeah. your school. We weren't allowed to read like, Harry Potter at school because it was witchcraft. <laughs> so when I was in high school, it was such a religious area that we had to get a waiver signed by our parents to learn about evolution. And I was one of seven kids in the class that week learning about evolution because all their parents pulled their kids out because they said it goes against their religious values, which is wild to me now because I, back then I was like why is this classroom empty you know <laughs> you're and, like it's just me yeah so okay take evolution and that's something that most people should learn you know right. that's kind of a given and then compare that to like how people were really not talking about queer being gay mm-hmm. that <laughs> don't talk about it yeah. there's no waivers for that right I dropped out I dropped out of Tennessee and I wanted to move to San Francisco for art school I had no clue that San Francisco was the gayest city of America <laughs> I had no idea no one talked to me about this I just knew California was a free place where you could start over again like a free a freeing place that you could feel that you could explore yourself and so I moved to Texas tried to because you were kind of like making it on your own mm-hmm. at this point yeah. because your family wasn't there to really support you yeah. at this time yeah, for and so many other reasons, but also just being the black sheep. Like there was something obviously different yeah. about you for some reason. Yeah. And so I feel like your journey of coming out also is like you really making it on your own. Like how old were you when you moved to Texas? I think... I think I was, I mean, it was after my first year of college, so like 18. Or and then you did construction, which. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't anyone tell a, me? Not a lesbian doing construction. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I moved to Texas and worked in construction, renovating these you must really have been so cute. old houses. <laughs> and I had like my hammer and I was like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah I, I saved up enough money to get to San Francisco and I got to San Francisco, put myself in school and I, I started art school, which I loved, which is kind of a foreshadowing to where we are now, right? And why I, I still love creative outlets and I love all of that. And when I went, moved to San Francisco, I met this guy who I kicked it off with really well. He was really funny, really cool. We hung out and um, we hooked up one of the first nights after drinking a lot and, and we hooked up and he looked at me and he was like, you're a lesbian, aren't you? And I was like, oh. <laughs> how dare you ever use the L word on me? I was like, absolutely no, I'm not. How offensive, you know, don't you ever say that. And he was like, no, you really are a lesbian. I was like, uh, no one's ever, ever said that to me, ever. No one's ever like used those words out loud. It was just always in my head. What if, you know? And he was like, no, you really are. You hated that. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, no, honestly, no. I did. <laughs> we ended up hanging out and, and chatting for hours. And I just realized, holy shit, I might actually, I might be a lesbian. It's crazy. And the good thing about San Francisco is I ended up meeting people and meeting 
a community of friends who were a lot of them were straight but super accepting like san francisco is so accepting when it comes to being queer because it's such a queer fluid city anyways that everyone was like don't worry i got you we're gonna make you the most gayest gay person out there like i (laughs) you're under my wings now this is when the snapbacks were coming in yeah (laughs) this is whenever I, i went from being told i have to dress like a girl wear makeup wear heels wear dresses to then moving to san francisco and then my straight friends were like, don't worry, I got you. This is how you dress like a lesbian. <laughs> you wear leather jackets. You wear your snapbacks. You wear T-shirts. Flannel. Yeah, yeah. You wear T-shirts with girls kissing each other on it. I don't know. I just went from this one extreme to, one to the other. other. Yeah, absolutely. So I was like, this is what lesbians wear. This is what I'm going to wear, you know. And so I started going to gay bars and I started, you know, I started meeting different people of different diversities. This is the first time I've met truly people outside of, you know, just two different ethnicities. I've met people from Spanish backgrounds, Latin backgrounds, Asian backgrounds, from all walks of life, which was already so mind-blowing to me. And then I was opened up to the whole idea of different sexualities and what that means to different people. And I'm just like, this is crazy. I've never known. How are people not knowing this in the south you know Mm -hmm. and I'm just like I'm so glad I got out of there and yeah so basically I ended up meeting I ended up working at the movie theater which by the way is a great job loved that job (laughs) that's still one of your favorite jobs it is you get free movies you get free popcorn you get free you get free slushies you get all the things and you can (laughs) just go to the movies anytime loved that job And then you also get a walkie-talkie, which makes you feel really cool. Yeah, you're official. Yeah. (laughs) So I actually met another girl there who was also openly gay at that time. And I wasn't out yet, but I met her. We kicked it off, and we were, like, seeing each other and dating, which made me feel more encouraged to come out. Yeah. I feel like it's always better when you have somebody there because at least it's not just you. Yeah. I feel like that's feels even more lonely but when it's like at least your partner is also kind of challenged with the fact of with challenged with the fact of coming out yeah it feels like there's someone you can talk to yeah exactly because also my san francisco journey was still surrounded by so many straight people which nothing wrong with that but i still didn't really have someone they can't understand like the experiences that you're about to go through exactly so we started dating and that kind of encouraged me to finally I wanted to I wanted to tell people I wanted to feel proud about it I wanted people to ask me about my relationship so I remember again I drinking a lot I I drink a lot at this period of time um I remember drinking a lot and I called my sister and I called her bawling and I was like I just have to get this off my chest I have to tell someone and I I called my sister Mariah And I was like, I just have to tell you something. Please don't hate me. And I was like, I think I'm gay. I'm a lesbian. You know, I've got a girlfriend. She was like, I've known that for so long. (laughs) I was like, I was like, you didn't tell me. She was like, why? She was like, bitch, you are the, you are so gay looking. Look at you right now. And I was like, you're rude, first of all, but thank you for not disowning me. Uh, Yeah. And she's, she's always been my rock a little bit with my family. I think she's always been someone that had my back and she's always just like, (laughs) she knew before you knew and she's younger than you. (laughs) Yeah. She's, I'm the oldest. So yeah, she's always just been like, it's really not that big of a deal. Like, chill, you're fine. Oh, my gotta youngest, love her. Yeah. <laughs> my youngest sister was the last one I told in my family. So the next two that I told was my, my dad. I told him that I was lesbian and he was like okay that's fine he's like I just want you to be happy at the end of the day that's all I want and I think I got very lucky with my parents reactions to me coming out because both of them were very accepting my parents were weirdly okay with all of that like totally fine which I was like wow this is great and I think I purposely told my youngest sister last Last. because my youngest sister was the most religious out of all of us um, she definitely took her religious studies the most intense. Like Mariah and I lived together growing up in the same room. Like we shared a room and we'd come home and after being re- rebels all day and my youngest sister would put like post-it notes all over our stuff with Bible quotes. Oh my God. Yeah. Like John three fourteen, like that, and like on our lighters and on like my <laughs> bottle of alcohol, my sister would put like, this is again, this is a sin. And I'm like, leave me alone. Stay out of my room. But it's funny. So I, I think that all played into me being most nervous about her 
Um, but weirdly, you know, she was very open. It took her more time than everyone else. She was just like, look, I don't understand. I don't understand at all why you're doing this or why you feel like this is for you. But look, I love you. And that's the end of it. Right. Like, I'm going to be here for you no matter what. So, yeah, my family was pretty cool with it. Like, totally fine, which made me feel more encouraged to tell everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. The next day I was like. That was a lot of emotional baggage to go through each family member and call them one after another and be like, Ugh. the fact that you called everyone individually. Yeah. I would have been like, I let's get on a Skype call. Everyone. <laughs> I have something to say. I, I got, have a PSA right now. <laughs> so this, is what, this is how it kind of led into my next thing. I did not have the emotional capacity to call each one of my friends from home and tell them absolutely not. So I was like, you know what has a massive platform? Facebook so I got on Facebook and I literally got on the status of Facebook and I was like I said something along the lines of I have something I need to get off my chest I'm gay boom shakalaka and I posted it and literally everyone that had ever followed me my whole life saw that status and were I mean it got a lot of acceptance which was really nice but all my cousins found out that way my aunts and my uncles my old friends from high school everybody right everyone I guess in a way like that's kind of nice too because you don't have to go individually to tell them and so like if they don't accept you I mean you kind of know why yeah because you said it publicly to every single person yeah well I also had no intention of going back to Tennessee anytime soon and I think 90 percent of the people that followed me were from that side of the world so I was like I'm over here I'm chilling you can't reach me in California yeah. Eventually, I did want to go back and visit my college friends. That's where my best friend still was. You remember, like, Kristen still lived there, so I wanted to go back and visit. And I remember I went back and visited, and this is after many months of me dating a girl now. I I was... You're like, you're feeling a little more comfortable super in who you comfortable. are. And I'm dressing how I... I was dressing more mass, more tomboy, for sure. I was starting to feel myself more and feel empowered with my own self, my self journey and coming out. And so I, I thought... I got a lot of acceptance through the Facebook status. No one really said anything really mean. So I thought me going back to Tennessee would be really cool. I feel like people would finally take me for who I am. And I think that I wasn't prepared with the amount of reactions that I got when I went home. So I went back to visit my college where I was and pretty much we were at the bar and I was my first time being reunited with a lot of people that I went to school with and basically all my friends that were at that university basically sat me down at the bar and had an intervention. They were like, you need to know right now that you never deserve the right to get married. You need to know that your sex will never count. What's it like to feel like you're going to hell? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sad for you because you will be going to hell one day. Crazy. And um, it was just real. It was really ridiculing. And I remember calling some of my my best friend that lived in San Francisco now, Sean. I called him and I was like, "I'm really heartbroken right now. I feel I've never felt so ashamed in my entire life. Like I've never felt so lonely, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, with all these people who are just telling me you're wrong. And there's the still like living. no visibility there right. and not someone that you can run over to. Yeah, exactly. And and to hear your friends tell you this after you've gotten acceptance from family and stuff, to hear someone literally I feel tell like you it's weirder to have your friends go back on you mm -hmm. versus your family. Because at least with family, like you could give them the past of being like religion or traditions or you know they're old school mm -hmm. and like that's not what their generations taught them but the fact that it's your friends that mm -hmm. are not supporting you and these people are the people that should love you because of you like you've literally grown up together yeah exactly and I think that made it hurt so bad you know it it would have hurt with my family, but then again, I wasn't super family oriented. Your uh, friends part, were your family. My friends were my family, so it hurt a lot, like to my core. And, and it's still something that I remember like yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. and it's been 12 years or something like that. So, um, yeah, it hurt a lot. And I remember I called my friend Sean. He goes, come back here. 
where you're loved, where you're accepted, and where everyone loves you for who you are. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went back to California and I told myself I wasn't going to go back to Tennessee because why would I go somewhere where I'm not loved? Why would I go somewhere where people don't make me feel like I'm enough? And so I went back to California and I went and I was... And that's kind of why you say San Francisco is your home. Yeah. Because that's truly where you found yourself. You Mm -hmm. came out, you didn't do things for other people you did it for yourself yeah absolutely and I did it all by myself too in a mm-hmm. way obviously which I had is a huge group. yeah and I think that that's where my independence and my self journey really sparked where I was like I'm not gonna let anyone tell me I can't and this also simultaneously is when I knew my aunt was in a relationship with a woman and continuously for over a decade told everyone that she was um you know, roommates, roommates. And I recognize this now that you felt that no one was going to love you. And, and I mean, and people, to, to some extent, she was kind of right. Absolutely. She like l- would have dealt with that. And absolutely. Had no one. And like you told yourself you're going to leave and you did leave. But I don't know if your aunts would have necessarily left where they are. Absolutely. And because they were very family oriented, which is totally great. And I think for me, I remember that I felt so sad for them. A lot of compassion in the sense and empathy in the sense that they're never going to be able to tell everyone who they truly are. Right. Their family isn't going to even though their family knows it's different whenever you can completely confess it and everyone, you know, everyone accepts you for who you are, right? Mm-hmm. You can talk about it. You can be open. You can hold your partner's hand in public, right? I think I remember seeing that that was my only semi tiny bit of representation and being like, if you have to silence yourself in the love that you have for this amazing other person and y'all have to be quiet with your relationship, then I'm not going to live here. I'm going to move somewhere where I can scream it at the, at the rooftop uh, how much I love my partner, how much I love myself, how much I, how much I want to be out and proud and everyone needs to know it. And if you don't love me for me, then I'm not, then that's, that's fine. We don't have to be in my life. Right. So I remember always using that as a motivation in the sense that I will be truly who I am because I have one life right so yeah my my first relationship lasted around three years I thought for sure three and a half maybe I thought for sure I was going to be with this person forever it was definitely my first love I mean I had dated guys in high school I had a long-term relationship in high school when Mm -hmm. I was a freshman he was a senior and we dated for a very long time but he was always like my buddy he was like my best friend but also he was you know I, I never felt a emotional connection like I did with women right Mm -hmm. he was like my best guy my guy buddy but at the time I thought that that's what I was supposed to be doing was dating guys so my first female relationship I was just like so in love over the moon I feel like that's how we all are too yeah like that first experience for you because it's your first love your first everything it's like your first kiss, your first, Mm -hmm. I don't know, intimate experience, like all of these things that... It was my first time soberly being with someone who Mm -hmm. was of the same sex, which is scary in itself, right? Because all my previous times ever being any kind of physical reaction to a girl, whether that was kissing so that the boys saw or getting drunk in college and having that one night, it was just always around alcohol. And I think my first relationship was just so eye-opening. And I was like, I can never come back from this because it was sober, kind of, you know, like it started like that. And this was like, I'm not doing this because I have liquid courage I'm doing this because I have genuine courage I have courage to be with this person because I love being around this person Mm -hmm. you know ultimately we I learned a lot from that relationship because I learned all the things that I really wanted in my life and for me moving from Tennessee to Texas to San Francisco I always had it in the back of my head that if I could get this far where else could I go Mm -hmm. could I go to Europe could I go to South America and that's where your yeah itch for traveling also yeah. happened absolutely where I was like where else can I go the world is actually kind of smaller than I thought it would be if I could get all the way here by myself then I could probably go somewhere else too so yeah I, I ended up um, going through this three-year relationship having a really 
hard time. I realized we actually were a lot more unlike than we were alike. We grew apart, essentially. And we broke up, and then I ended up... Buying a one-way ticket to Europe. <laughs> yep. Which essentially rolled into where we met. Cash and flights, not feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you're out. And I feel like, to that note, like, I feel like we do come out every day. Like, mm-hmm. if somebody hasn't seen our platform, and we don't always talk... Obviously, we're talking about it on this podcast, but typically, I feel like when we introduce ourselves, we don't even talk about on airplane mode. Mm-mm. Um But we do say we're a couple, and I feel like that is us outing ourselves every single day to Mm -hmm. people we meet. I mean, even with our platform, we've had people come up to us and they say, wow, I love your content. It's so beautiful. But can you just be less gay about it? And I'm like, that's literally the whole point. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, that is literally the whole point. And I'm like, if you don't like it, don't follow it. It's totally fine. It's not going to make me cry. I'm not offended. Yeah. (laughs) I get it. It's not for everybody. And I never have any intention of it being for everybody. But I think the whole point of us sharing our relationship and our life is because both of us came from backgrounds where we had no representation. And maybe I look now and, and if I was a kid now and I saw all these social media platforms or representation in movies and TV and books, would my life have been so confusing? And would I have ever felt this? Would it have so taken lost? so long? Like, I mean, even my trajectory from 11 to college, mm-hmm. like eight, nine years. Yeah. I struggled with coming out. It was yeah. like not the most pleasant experience. Yeah. And I think. Even if you are coming out, there are flows to it, right? It's not like you just come out and you're like, bam, that's it for the rest of life. There's, I mean, there's been times where I started off where I said I was bi and then I moved into, no, I think I'm a lesbian. No, I think I'm bi. Actually, am I straight? No, I'm definitely not straight. That's, it's not a phase, right? I I just knew I felt comfortability in, in being the identity of being a lesbian. And it's just funny that, you know, it takes years sometimes because it just, you are so gaslit into feeling like you're wrong that you're, you're, it's hard to just accept that. I don't know this, this, it feels right because it is, Yeah, you know, I don't know. Well, thank you for sharing your (laughs) coming out story. I actually, no, genuinely, I think that people near need to hear these coming out stories because a lot of the time, with our platform it feels like it was always easy Mm -hmm. and it's because we share our life every day like it wasn't always easy for sure and like everyone deals with things like this and hopefully they don't and I Mm -hmm. hope that our platform you know can show even not just them but their parents yeah sometimes to be more accepting or their friends to be more supportive yeah And it's also people in different places who might not have the opportunity or, you know, the safe net, the safety net around them to come out. They, they message us and say they're living vicariously until they have the day they they come across the day where they can come out themselves. And I I think the people's coming out stories are going to be different every single time, but I hope that eventually one day we don't have to have coming out stories. That's really my hope eventually, Mm -hmm. you know? So we've reached the point in our episode where we will be answering your Q&As that you all submitted through the link in our bio. And these are particular to our, to the coming out story. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of nice and perfect. Um, When did you know that you were ready to come out? That's a loaded question. (laughs) Yeah. You have another three hours or something? (laughs) No, I think when I knew I was ready was when I had a little taste of acceptance, right? The first time in San Francisco when everyone said, don't worry, it's really okay. It's not, it's not a bad thing to be queer. Like it's actually pretty awesome. It's pretty fucking cool that you are wanting to be who you truly are and be proud of that. I think that little taste of acceptance made me like, I'm not going to be living in the closet. That closet needs to be closed. Like, let's go. Let's wrap it up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be sheltered. I didn't want to be living a lie. And I think it's also like my rebellious state of, I just want to be out there. I don't want to feel like I have to hide anything. Yeah. I Um, think I also wanted to meet people. Like it was, if I'm closeted, it's less opportunities for me to actually meet people that are like me. Yeah, no, it's true. Next question. What was your gay canon event? I feel like I have a few. I already have my answer. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> the Buttons music video, the Pussycat Dolls. I don't know why. That, that music video coming on, I remember sitting up and being like, you're like, ooh, what's that ceiling yeah. inside? Why do I feel warm? I remember MTV <laughs> just had it on repeat, and I was not upset about it. And still to this day, day, Nicole is like one of my top five. But also, I'd have to say there was an episode in John Tucker Must Die where Sophia Bush kisses. Or that scene. Yeah, where she kisses her in the car. I remember telling my sisters like oh let's watch this movie again and again and again because and i just, just this one scene <laughs> of sophia no Bush i would sit through out. i would sit through the whole two hour movie just for that one it was like a three second scene and i remember being like <laughs> like at the coming, edge of your seat and you're like best part of the whole movie <laughs> yeah, i didn't know why <laughs> and i was like <laughs> and i looked at my sisters who were just like eating popcorn like <laughs> and i'm like do it again, replay. It's like, oh, you weren't watching? Let me re back it up a bit. <laughs> but I don't, I didn't know why. I just was just like, that right. was the best part. And look at Sophia Bush now, by the way. I knew it. The T. I'm just saying. I know, we all knew it. We all knew it. Um, okay, my canon event, Angelina Jolie. Yeah. And Gia in Girl Interrupted in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Are yeah. you kidding? Like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I used to pretend that I was Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. I know. Well, yeah. I was confused because I was like, do I want to be her or do I want to be with her? Like, <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't know. I think you're still trying to figure that out. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm like, damn. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I remember, obviously, the L word was a big one, but it's funny, too, because one of my other aunts, I remember being, like, a little baby, baby Kirsty, and I remember going into, like, playing with my cousins, and we were just having, like, a cousin's day, and, like, going into my aunt's room, and, I, and a different aunt, and I remember seeing, like, the L word cover, and I was like, what's this? All these women on the cover. Because back in the day, there weren't a lot of just TV shows with women on the cover in general. So I just thought it was just like one of those gossip shows. Like, uh, what's the one of them in New York City? Gossip Girl? No, the oh. one, the, Carrie Bradshaw, the one you watched. Sex in the City. That one, the one that you watched all the time. I never really watched that one. I mean, but, it practically is Sex in the City. Yeah. Yeah. For so I remember seeing that. I'm like, what is this? But then, of course, fast forward a couple years later and I watched it and I was like, why did that cover fascinate me so much? It's just interesting, right? Yeah. Okay, last question. What advice would you give to someone who can't come out to their family? This is this is a good question. I think this is a really good question because I don't think there's any set answer, right? Right. Everyone's coming out journey is very different, and it's very... Um, you have to be very delicate with it, right? Because you shouldn't ever force someone to come out if it's not their time and not feel ready. I think coming out takes a lot of courage and sometimes you're just not ready to accept or to explore that side of yourself yet. I definitely think that you should never live in in fear forever because I do feel like the moment you do come out, you're going to feel so much better about yourself and you're going to say, why didn't I do this before? You're going to say, I that's, wish that I... That's yeah. what we've... That's like the general consensus yeah. from any person we've ever talked to. I think usually the fear of coming out comes with, are people going to abandon me? Am I going to be isolated? But I do think that might be the case sometimes. And that's the unfortunate reality that we all live in. But I think the other reality is that when you lose certain people, it leaves space for new people to come into your life and fulfill those places where others made you feel like less than you are. And so I think that when you do come out, it's like you said, you're actually giving other people an opportunity to to love you for who you truly are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, it's always worth a chance and letting people know that side of you. Yeah. But only if you're doing it in a safe space, you know. You, yeah, you I was going to say, unsafe. like, just make sure you have everything lined up for you so that you're always prepared mm -hmm. for anything that's going to come at you. And I, I feel like that's how yeah. you should treat life anyway. Just be prepared. and For sure. Um, do I think it the, when you're safe and when you're ready. And Yeah. I think the nice thing, too, is if you're in the process of figuring out what to do next, 
follow people on social media like not just us but there's so many queer creators out there in all different backgrounds and verticals of the identities industry. and everything exactly. that are figuring it out absolutely and- who who aren't even just expressing their sexual orientation but they're also expressing different gender identities and gender norms and things like that i think that it's really important to find people who you truly connect with because that's gonna ultimately make you feel the most seen and dm them i think most people have platforms because they want to help so Mm -hmm. find them dm them they can probably lead you to people who will make you feel most accepted in the first place so yeah i think those are some good pieces of advice thank you so much for tuning in please be sure to like and subscribe if you're enjoying this podcast and if you want to submit some future questions you can go on to our link in our bio on at on airplane mode two underscores or at kirsty and christine And tune in for next week's episode because we're going to be talking everything LGBTQ travel. What are our favorite destinations, our least favorite destinations? (laughs) You're not going to want to miss this one.